like uh, where the parameter come from like uh, some of the parameters like uh, discount rate and uh, this depreciation rate is a kind of standard number but the non standard number is a borrowing constraint how much equity you can sell to finance investment and also the this five like uh, how much equity other people's equity or own or mortgage capital stock you can remortgage or resell so these two numbers, theta and phi, and also probability of investment, like uh, which you don't have a hard number. So how do you do that? And uh, of course, the John and I were kind of relaxed about this is just a numerical example. So I want to show you how qualitative features. And then people, more serious looking people, like especially New York Fed people, actually said, how important is this? And uh, how much we saved the world, or how much we didn't save the world. <laughs> and uh, and uh, all these things, you need uh, some numbers. So, so New York Fed people immediately find out uh, this is not what happening. Like, uh, say the shock hit, like uh, we don't see the consumption shoots up. And uh, that's wrong. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, asset price go the wrong way. And uh, even with storage, stock price hardly drops. <laughs> like, uh, it drops like a 25%. It drops like a 0.1%. It's kind of too, too little. So, so then with New York Fed people, uh, we decided to do a little bit of calibration more serious systematically. I don't want to go too much detail, but the idea in order to do the calibration, we have to go away from a little bit of log. And uh, you need uh, some labor supply things. And uh, what we did is basically, instead of individual is investing or uh, the buying asset, so we assumed that there is a continuum at the household with continuum of members. It's like uh, all days, a big Chinese family. Like uh, they know, like uh, you do, like uh, investment, you do saving, <laughs> and, and you do working. And then at the, at the weekend, uh, they got together to consume together. So, so it's like a family uh, with enormous number of people to share the risk. And the advantage of using this is it now we can use the representative household uh, construct. And uh, what we have is the same as before, but uh, we now have, a, instead of money, we use the treasury securities as a counterpart of liquid assets. And of course, P has to be price level instead of inverse to talk to the central banker. <laughs> and, uh, and then the, this is the liquidity co budget constraint of members. Basically, uh, in the morning, everybody has the same portfolio. During the day, some people bump into the investment opportunity, some don't. And then the people who have investment opportunity, uh, I can be positive. And uh, this is the same budget constraint for member J. And uh, they face the same budget cons uh, liquidity constraint, uh, resellability constraint, and uh, borrowing constraint. And the uh, treasury security, you cannot go negative. Somebody asked the, like, uh, why don't you issue the more bond? <laughs> Turns out to be individual cannot commit to pay. And uh, also, the finance uh, use the, all the commitment for issuing equity. So you don't have extra commitment. So this treasury security, only treasury can go negative. And uh, investment is the same as before. Like uh, uh, the down payment, investment price minus the amount you can finance. And uh, uh, the top is the, this is the down payment for one unit of investment. Top is the liquidity. And uh, nice things about the uh, representative household framework is now uh, Euler equation become more standard as the comparable to standard asset pricing model, like uh, uh, say uh, John Campbell's textbook. <laughs> and uh, the difference is that you have an extra term. Instead of just the marginal rate of substitutions, you have a, this is a return on treasury securities. So nominal one plus interest rate divided by inflation, one plus inflation. And this is a real return on uh, the treasury security uh, from day T to day T plus one. 
and that the treasury security it's a, has a liquidity service. What do you mean by liquidity service? It's a, uh, by uh, this act, the kappa, fa, be, uh, how do you call it? The fa, be, ba, kappa or something. And uh, this fraction, they have an investment opportunity. I used the uh, pi for invest in <laughs> the inflation, so this is now a fraction of people who have investment opportunity. And uh, then you have uh, extra liquidity. You can invest as much as one over down payment price of new capital minus the, uh, the amount you can finance by issuing equity, and how much you gain the gap between Tobin's Q and the replacement cost of the capital, or the stock market variation of capital versus the present, uh, production price of the capital. So that's the liquidity service. And the equity, uh, the, uh, the treasury security, you have 100% liquidity, while equity, the return dividend part uh, is uh, you get the consumption return, total return, but the, in terms of liquidity, only resellable component is the providing liquidity. So, so this is the liquidity fact, kind of liquidity asset pricing model, you can say. So how do you get this kind of numbers? And uh, the one we thought about it is the Think about the, the perfectly riskless so, uh, one period nominal bond, but the dividend is paid at the end of the period instead of beginning of the period. As a result, for consumption, it's perfectly okay, but the, for investment, uh, you cannot use it. Like, uh, it's a bit like a, a commercial paper, high quality commercial paper, and uh, it's less liquid than, in this case, totally illiquid. <laughs> Uh, before getting maturity. And so this is the, uh, for the illiquid asset. So then when you look at the uh, yield gap between the perfectly illiquid but safe uh, bond versus the uh, treasury securities, that yield gap, like a commercial paper yield versus the treasury yield gap, is corresponding to roughly the expected value of liquidity service. Uh, so that way you get some stuff. And so how do you calibrate? I use the uh, Krishnamati Bissing Jorgensen's picture. Basically, the horizontal line is the uh, treasury security supply relative to uh, nominal GDP. The vertical is the disconvenience yield, expected value of the liquidity service. And they have an estimate. Like uh, if you have a lot of them, the yield spread disappears. Right? And the smaller supply yield spread is bigger. And the average is around here, 0.4, and the average yield spread is about 0.5. And uh, so we basically calibrated uh, this yield spread, convenience yield, in data as well as model. And also uh, the uh, labor share, liquidity share. Liquidity share is the treasury security divided by total uh, securities, treasury security plus equity. And, uh, and uh, so what we get is uh, these numbers. Whether it's realistic or not, we have <laughs> a little bit. So borrowing constraint is basically 80% you can borrow, but not 20% not time. But resellability constraint, 31% uh, you can sell, but uh, another 70% you, you cannot sell right away. And the one problem we had is actually the probability of investing. It's actually it's 1% per quarter, which is incredibly small. <laughs> so the number set, you need uh, very little uh, investment. Yeah. Uh, it is a quarterly. Yeah. So 1% so quarter means 100 quarters <laughs> to get the every investment, which is kind of ridiculously infrequent. But the, the calibration set that we need. And uh, some of the lumpy investment uh, model, actually, the, we, we use alternative is 5%, which is every 20 quarter, every four years, five years, you invest. So, but the, that's a steady state. But uh, what about the shock? This is the 
the key because of the shock is the one <laughs> who generate. So in order to get the shock, what we did is the, we now pricing the every security which has a, a net zero supply. The representative household model, as long as uh, private securities and security has a zero supply in the aggregate, somebody supply, somebody uh, buy, <laughs> then it's all net out. So treasury security is outside and the equity is outside, but the, all the inside stuff you can price without affecting the allocations. And uh, as a result, we can price the yield uh, things as a function of the ma mono marginal rate of substitution and also the resellability, the resellability of each as a, and also this convenience yield or liquidity service. And then what we did is, uh, I mentioned a little bit to you, uh, basically the looking at the 16 pair of the securities, which has a identical payoff, but a different liquidity. And uh, so when you look at the average of before the crisis, this is the yield spread. It's a relatively small number. Some of them has a minus actually, <laughs> but uh, so the, like a, uh, Double, this is a CDS bond basis, means the uh, WA uh, corporate bond, but uh, in order to cover the default uh, loss, you combine with CDS on that. And uh, that combination has an identical payoff to the treasury, but the treasury is more liquid. So you have a one basis point uh, uh, spread and so on. So this is the, we use the steady state. During the crisis, it shoots up all of them. And uh, some of them become huge. Tri AAA bonds, the spread is like a 3.4%, and the many of them is above 1%. So the way we did it is the then uh, extract the dynamic component, dynamic factor from this, and uh, then call it as a liquidity shock. And, uh, no, steady state is uh, this one. Yeah, this one is a you and uh, we have a daily data, and uh, we assume the, the lowest liquidity one liquidity becomes zero, which is the the assumptions actually, and then all the others, you basically extract the common component of this pair, and the reason you can do it is the the shock is coming from the state variable is partly capital stock and other things, which moves very slowly. And uh, my liquidity shock is the one who moves fast. And uh, as a result, we can say approximate the dynamic system is one factor. And uh, so then by extracting fast factor of the common ad spread, you can basically construct the like a shock series, shock shoots up. This is a convenience yield, yield expected value of the liquidity uh, service, this guy, this, this one. And uh, so, so you basically do the calibration by doing this. And then you can see the, our shock is, shock is the size is basically, the shock size is the, the uh, liquidity shock, the 30% liquidity becomes 9%. It's a huge drop, actually, 30 to 9. And then, uh, like, uh, persistence is uh, like that. So when you do that, model will generate the about, like, 4.5% drop in GDP, uh, which is smaller than 8% drop. 7-8% of GDP, but uh, we do get the sizable fractions. Inflation is almost the uh, uh, entire amount. And also Fed fund rate dropped to zero. And, uh, and the consumption is surprisingly okay. And uh, investment also drops. And the convenience yield is the one which we calibrated uh, to map. And one thing which we never get is the stock market. 
stock market drop in the data is 25%, while the hours is like only 5%. So that's the uh, difference. So, yeah, yeah, these are the numbers. Ah, this, yeah, this one. Yeah. Yeah, they have a. I don't know, five year tips, and then you try to ex using this sort of formula. And then try to get this. Uh, yeah, I, it's uh, partly risk, part, but uh, this is like a five year tips versus, and uh, uh, you converted everything in. Uh, how do you call the zero, uh, like, uh, strip, right? yeah, strip. So, yeah. so. But then when, you, when you're talking about the seven, I think yeah. I imagine what you're yeah. doing yeah. that you're calculating in some form of the expected inflation. How, how, uh, how, do, how do you do to, to, to ah, okay. But so, so, so tip. Is it nominal bonds and some inflation forecast? Yeah, yeah. So you basically put together the, uh, like, uh, one is the treasury securities, and actually the we buy. Yeah, inflation swap. We, we basically combine the tip with inflation swap, and then yes. we get the zero, uh, how do you call it, the, the discount bond away. So instead of, <laughs> it's a combination of discount bond, but uh, we just look at the zero coupon bond away. To to normalize to to com make it to be comparable. Yeah. So normally tips are spread is not. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Point three percent. Yeah. But the, during the crisis, it even shoots up like a one point nine spread in terms of well, zero coupon. Right, but it's the same thing once yeah. Before. Yeah. 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 That's right. So around here, yeah, yeah. Uh, the uh, 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 uh -huh. No, yeah, we don't have a bankruptcy. We, it might be, yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah, we don't have a lot of <laughs> things. We just have equity and uh, uh, treasury securities. But the nice things about this uh, representative one is actually. Zero supply, zero net supply things. It doesn't affect aggregate allocations, but still you can price it uh, by using the uh, oil equations. So, so, so this is what we get. So in this sense, the nice, the the reason we did this is a counterfactual. So counterfactual is if suppose the Fed didn't do any uh, interventions liquidity facilities. We have a data about uh, how much liquidity facilities they provided. And uh, so this is the liquidity facility. The baseline is liquidity facility was there. But the counterfactual is, counterfactual is suppose they didn't do it, how much the gap. So gap is the facility minus the non-facility. So this is the how much extra out output loss we avoided. It's so like a 1.5 additional. And how much inflation could be worse? Like instead of 2.5% drop, it's 3.5% drop, something like that. And uh, that all depends upon also persistence. Persistence, we, carry, we assumed uh, people expected the zero low amount for one and a half years in the market at the time. So we used this. But the, in reality, it was much longer than one fund, five, and they say almost like a five years or four years. So if you use the five years instead of 1.5 years, now the Fed facility was enormously uh, big. <laughs> so, so basically, the Fed facility avoided 9% additional drop. So it could be instead of 6% drop, it, it would be 15% drop. So, so in this sense, this is of course biased towards the Fed employee of my course. But uh, <laughs> they basically avoided that big disaster, like a nine percent extra drop in GDP. 
And uh, so this is, of course, we, the kind of questionable. So we put the title question. So. <laughs> Yeah. Which of the, which of the yeah. Ah, the liquidity facility part. Like, uh, facility part. yeah, yeah, and it's not the additional part. It so disappears after two years, but uh, that one was uh, crucial during the Lehman time and after that. So, but uh, anyway, so this is the uh, attempt to do the this calibration. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Co yeah, commercial paper facilities and uh, like uh, liquid the uh, asset uh, uh, liquidity facilities. They did some sort of like uh, Fed is buying uh, the Fed is lending against the recent asset backed commercial paper. Yeah, yeah, and uh, some of them is non non recall space. Like uh, they bought it. Uh, they, they lend against uh, newly issued asset back securities or mortgage back securities with 10% haircut and 1% spread. But uh, if value drop more than 10%, you don't have to repay. So, so that's a liquidity facility. We, uh, yeah. So I'm wondering whether we are able to say something about uh, the mm. discussion of uh, mm. This is a co uh, unconventional monetary policy. No, the reason is the when uh, detail, please look at the paper. Conventional one hit the zero lower bound, and uh, we impose the zero lower bound. Mm -hmm. So, so that's where the non-conventional starts kicking in. So, so, so you would you would argue mm. in the of, uh, yeah. should have these uh, non-conventional. Uh, ah, no. Uh, yeah, only, only, only in the zero lower band. band. Yeah, zero lower band is uh, is not binding. You can reduce interest rate, which works well. In, in, in this uh, full blown version, actually we have a sticky price, so the, the money is not neutral. Actually, the, uh, so so then it works. Like uh, reducing conventional interest rate to drop quite a bit and is yeah no, no yeah 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 you don't need it. Actually, the most re the reason you need it is hitting zero lower bound. Yes. Okay, but uh, you may ask the where the uh, this liquidity shock come from. One is the uh, adverse selection things we did in the, but the other things which liquidity shock potentially come is the. Oops, that's not mine. Yeah, this is number two. So, <laughs> okay. So, so this is the where the liquidity shock come from, and uh, we want to introduce the banks. And uh, uh, I heard Eric introduce the bank <laughs> things uh, yesterday a little bit. You <laughs> some bank run things. So we are going to introduce the bank run into the things. So. So the question we want to ask is usually the banking crisis is the one which liquidity dry out. And uh, so how to think about a big banking crisis, like a financial crisis? And uh, usually people said it follows the credit booms. And, uh, but uh, when you look at the data, not every credit boom goes to the financial crisis. Actually, the and then how do you do the policy? So this is the Krishna Marty Muir's recent uh, uh, the survey paper uh, using the uh, like a hundred years of the data of many country, many advanced countries. And uh, when you look at uh, this date zero, year zero is the crisis time. And uh, before the crisis, like uh, five years, this is annual actually. The spread is lower than normal. And then before the one year or two years before, it starts going up. And uh, after the, yeah? Spread of the uh, co uh, corporate bond versus the treasury. Because of the, it comes from 1870 to 1939. 
and the uh, 45 to uh, 2015 or something, which old one you don't have a good spread. Like uh, so, you they use the corporate bond, high quality corporate bond versus the, and then you see the spread go up, the around the a little before the crisis and then shoots up, and then stay there, and the credit pass. It looks like uh, there is a, this is a, a linear trend, <laughs> like a pre-war, post-war, separate for each country. So, so then against uh, how much deviation from the linear trend? This is like uh, before the crisis, you are above the linear trend. And the crisis, there is a DD valley going on. And the GDP pass the against the linear trend. Uh, the you have seen the after the crisis, it did drop. So this is a conditional on date zero. Sorry. Yeah? What's the zero again? Zero is a crisis year, the banking crisis. That's falling first, and then there's the banking crisis. So yeah, this is like a, yeah, yes. So, so this is a year GDP drops. Uh, this is annual. So, so it's like a one year before to this year. You have a drop, and then, yeah, 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 yeah. That's right. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Two years. So this is the two year, one year before, and then starts dropping, and then we have a crisis. And the, but the problem of this kind of exercise is you know, ex post, uh, you have a crisis. So, so this is nothing to do with forecastability of the, uh, so. If you do the unconditional one using the original data of the Schralik and Taylor, and this is the credit growth of the uh, against the uh, mean, uh, the country by country, uh, the what is the two years ago uh, growth rate? Two years to one year ago, uh, the credit growth. This is one year ago to crisis. Uh, the this years. Uh, the credit growth rate. And uh, you see the lot of dotted line. <laughs> and uh, the orange one is a crisis at day T. And you can see the two year consecutive growth, this, t this area, like uh, two years ago, there is a growth. One year ago to now, there is a growth. There is a more orange one. <laughs> In this sense, there is more. But uh, there are a lot of blue one even that range. And also the red one <laughs> is also there too. So in this sense, the, there is a lot of false alarm. Basically, credit is growing two consecutive years. doesn't mean the, uh, you have a, a crisis. So you want to have a model which explains the uh, crisis as well as the uh, false alarm too. So, so credit growth often leads to the likely to use the crisis, but not always. And uh, in that kind of environment, how do you do the policy? So that's the question we want to ask. So in order to do that, we are going back to the uh, little model, <laughs> which is basically the uh, capital. The asset is either financed by the bank or business. And the uh, and, uh, banker can uh, finance everything by equity. Maybe this picture is easier to see. Like a household has a saving, they can deposit to the bank, or any kind of short-term financing is there. Like a bank means the including the shadow banks too. And then the banker is going to finance the business, and the way we consider typical model, borrowing constraint is here. So this morning's borrowing constraint was here between the, uh, the, uh, the investing agents and non-investing agents. But here we decided there is no financial friction between banks and business. So bank is actually own the business or buy the equity, and uh, there is no friction about it. And, uh, the only friction is between banks and the household. So financial friction we are going to have is in between here. So typically model, if you add something, 
you want to subtract the other one, otherwise getting more and more com complicated. So we decided ignore the financial friction between banks and business. But the between banks and the household, there is a moral hazard problem. I'm going to talk about it. And also household can buy the equity, but uh, they are not as good as bankers. And uh, basically the household in order to get the return on capital, this is a dividend or return on capital, and the capital supply is constant and uh, perfectly durable. But in order to get the same return as the bankers, uh, household need the extra input, which is the, uh, we call it the management cost, which is basically the every, some of the equities are very easy to uh, for the household to finance, like a publicly traded equities. But uh, if household starts buying more and more equities, it becomes more and more difficult, and uh, like a private equities or small business. So management cost is going up. While a banker has already have a management ca capability, so you don't need the extra input. So therefore, if you look at this, why the household will directly finance? Well, <laughs> they just uh, give the everything into the bank because of that's better. This is the debt weight. M extra management cost is like a debt weight cost. The reason is the banker is not trustworthy, uh, which I'm going to explain. Uh, so the, my lecture is all about the limited commitment. So, so we have a <laughs> limited commitment now. Do you have any questions? Are you all right? Yeah. <laughs> No, no. So the, this is the, there is a lot of blue dot, which is the, means that there is no crisis after two years of the boom. But the claim you are refuting sounds very strong. No, what they say is conditional on date zero, observing a crisis, we tend to have a credit growth before, and the credit deleveraging afterwards. But uh, this is conditional on date zero is the, so it's consistent actually. This is a conditional statement, and, uh, but so this is uh, unconditional. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
and the worker supply labor and uh, bring the wage back home. And uh, each banker manages the bank and uh, retain some profit inside and uh, pay the rest to the dividend. Key constraint is the, uh, you cannot pay the negative dividend or you cannot uh, uh, raise the equity <laughs> except at the beginning. At the beginning, you get a little money. So this is like a Chinese family model. So uncle is a boss. Say, uncle said, you do bank, you do <laughs> work. <laughs> and then banker gets the little startup funds. But after that, you cannot ask uncle again, can I get the money more? And the only things you can do is retain the profit. And the, in this kind of environment, any kind of expected financial friction, the banker wants to retain everything. So the only time they pay the dividend is the retirement time. So retirement time, a uh, banker is going to bring the, all the net worth to the household. And uh, other than that, they retain everything. So, so this one minus sigma is basically the dividend payout ratio out of the net worth. So, so and then when the, these people retire, the, the new one comes. And uh, without this retirement, actually there is no dividend payout. As a result, they start accumulating uh, net worth until financing constraint uh, is no longer binding. So we do have a, a dividend payout uh, to get the financing constraint effective. So a previous model, actually, there is no such restrictions. But the return on equity is uh, asset is lower than time preference. Therefore, the household uh, the entrepreneur didn't uh, accumulate so much big fund. But uh, here, we need something because of the it's a, a family model. Uh, we need this uh, dividend payout. Otherwise, the uh, financing constraint is no longer binding. So, do you have you seen this kind of model before? Oh, I, I probably guess not. But the, uh, basically, the, this is the picture. So <laughs> the banker lays the deposit, and then. Uh, makes the financing. And the household is not as good. So this is the model which is not the deep model of bank, actually, I have to say. W why bank exist? Because of the household is terrible in financing <laughs> because of debt weight cost. So, and then next question is why bank may face the financing constraint? Bank has a moral hazard problem. It's kind of like, a, we are not uh, building the deep model of bank, actually. We uh, try to build up the small mo scale uh, ma macro model with bank, and uh, so we can play with it uh, to ask the question of financial crisis and uh, uh, prudential policies. So this is a household problem. Household is maximizing expected discounted utility of consumption subject to the budget constraint. What's the budget constraint? Consumption and the deposit, and the purchase of equity. Q is the price of equity. This is the uh, price of capital stock, and this is the price of quantity of capital ownership. But the, when household buy the equity, you have to pay the, this management cost. So this is the debt weight cost. How do you finance? Partly wage, and the partly uh, profit coming back from retiring bank, net of the startup funds. This is the net payout of the banking sector. This is the return on uh, deposit. And the return on deposit is mostly predetermined, but the crisis time, it's going to be a pro rata base, total assets per unit of deposit. And uh, this is the return on equity, uh, dividend plus resale value not depreciation. And when you do it, the maximization, you get the standard uh, Euler equation for the uh, deposit. And uh, this is the marginal rate of substitution. And uh, this is the return on equity. The difference from usual model is that we now have a marginal cost of the management. So 
marginal cost is not just buying equity, but also you have to pay extra cost for acquiring, uh, managing the extra unit of capital stock. And then return is the dividend plus resale, same as everyone. Okay, that's the household. How about the bankers? Uh, banker is going to maximize the expect for the sake of the household, representative household. So they are valuing in terms of the uh, marginal rate of substitutions. And uh, here, the, this is the marginal rate of substitution between day t and day t plus one. And then next period, the probability one minus sigma, they exit, they become consumers. So they are using this one for the consumption value. But the, if you continue with probability sigma, the value is the continuation value, V, T plus one. And the balance sheet of the bank is the asset is either financed by deposit or the net worth. And the where the net worth come from, if newcomers is the exogenous uncles given, but the, the for the old timers, it's a return on uh, banking business from last period. The banker buy the equities. This is a return on equity and net of the uh, depositors payment. And the, we call it RV as a rate of return on uh, <coughs> equity. So we are going to have a spread between rate of return on equity versus the, uh, the deposit interest rate later on. And uh, this is the key picture of the uh, model. Actually, I told you the always there is a key, key picture or key, key uh, the inequality, and uh, this is the one actually. So the after the productivity shock realizes, and then the you got the net worth, and put together the deposit, banker will buy the asset, purchase the equity ownership. It's all like a security-based bank, like a investment banking. One way to operate is the, they are going to uh, do the honest business and the repay to the depositor, retain net worth, uh, continue our exit. But the other way to do the business is uh, steal the money, actually. This is uh, crude, crude, like uh, as crude as possible. <laughs> Basically, the, the reason banker uh, may financing constraint is banker may divert the assets, actually. So say the fraction of assets, they can divert for personal consumption. And uh, this is the, so, so as I told, this model is a need, not the deep theory of bank. Like uh, the reason bank exists is the bank is better in financing than household. The banker face the financing constraint because of banker may steal the money. And, uh, I can give you the one, one example. One. Actually, the, my family business is banking, so. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so the, and uh, my grandfather was a banker, my father was a banker, and uh, I might have told you some time, but uh, actually the, uh, my grandfather was a banker from age 27 until age 77, 50 years, actually running the CEO of the bank. Uh, and then when I was a kid, like uh, he was running the bank in Osaka, which is the, the far away from Tokyo. Uh, but uh, there is a bankers association meeting every two months. So he come to Tokyo, uh, we live. And then after the meeting, he said, okay, let's go out for dinner. And uh, typically he took uh, me and uh, my elderly brother to the like a nice restaurant and one, I often go to the most expensive sushi restaurant in Ginza and he said all you can eat so, <laughs> so and, uh, 10 year kids and uh, 12 year kids they can eat a lot actually <laughs> especially it's the best sushi restaurant all you can eat we get so excited and and then one day my father who worked for that bank complain like, uh, do you know how much you eat last night? And then he said, uh, it's uh, three of you eat it almost the same as monthly salary of the 
angry, the typical employee. I was shocked how much does it cost, but at the same time, why my father knows how much we eat it? <laughs> and uh, the reason most likely is he charged to the bank. That's, <laughs> that's, why, <laughs> that's why that dinner <laughs> is, so, so they do die, but <laughs> for consumption. <laughs> <laughs> so, mm, so, yeah. No. <laughs> so, but, uh, but, uh, this, uh, yeah. Oh gosh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so he already passed away, and uh, sometimes he <laughs> he contributed to the bank free food. So, so, so he, he's basically the 50-year budget constraint becomes blah. So. So, so what happened is uh, sometimes they divert the assets, <laughs> and they're sometimes honest. And uh, in our model, actually, when you divert the assets, people will find out right away, next period. N not uh, like a Madoff. So, so key incentive constraint as a result is a franchise value, continuation value, have to be at least as good as the diversion benefit. So consumption value of diversion, has to be less than continuation value. This is the key incentive constraint. This is the like uh, Kingston valve. <laughs> you cannot, uh, without this, it doesn't work. So, okay. So the, the basically the banker's choice is just uh, how much leveraging up the assets relative to the net worth. And uh, everything is constant return. Like a budget constraint is retur constant return. And also valuation is constant return. And the even incentive constraint is constant return. So everything you can divert, divide it by the scale. The nice easy scale we divide is a net worth. So this is a franchise value relative to the net worth yeah, for the bank. So this is actually. Tobin's Q of the bank. Okay. We have a Tobin's Q in the morning, as well as Tobin's Q in the afternoon. This is the Tobin's Q of the bank instead of Antropuna. And uh, what is the tomorrow's value? Uh, one minus sigma probability is consumption value, but the sigma probability net worth is valued using the tomorrow's Tobin's Q. And then this is the consumption value marginal rate of substitution. So you can see the, uh, and the growth rate of the net worth. And the growth rate of the net worth is related to the uh, how much spread. And the spread part, the banker is earning extra return on equity over the deposit. So, so this is the earn extra earning by leveraging up. If you don't leverage, actually, the <laughs> The, you save the uh, deposit cost. So, so this is the banker's uh, Euler equation, basically. And uh, you can say stochastic discount factor of the banker is the not just the marginal rate of substitution, but the Tobin's cube component. And the, the financing model, always the tricky bits is how do you get the uh, very volatile stochastic discount factor we have here. And this is relatively smooth, but the uh, Tobin's Q jumps, <laughs> and uh, it's very risky. So you can get a uh, uh, reasonable uh, spread. And uh, in terms of the constraint, the you have to satisfy the household uh, oil equation. Household oil equation is uh, this guy. So deposit have to have a uh, good return, good enough return. And uh, basically, the deposit return is the same as promised return if you don't default. But uh, if the realized return on bank's assets uh, relative to deposit is lower than promised return, banker is going to default. And, and the banker is more likely to default if they're leveraging up too much. So, so the, this high leverage guy is more dangerous. <laughs> and uh, so you have to have a higher uh, de deposit promise. Yeah? You mentioned stochastic discount. Yeah. I, I assume we are the yeah. best, this, this is the losses stochastic discount. Yeah, yeah. But this 
a different thing than what the other was yeah, talking yeah. about. Because the households and banks yeah. don't compete in the same way. The households no. only have access to the same investments. Yeah. Right? Yeah, that's oh, right. Uh, that's right. So that's the test that this comes back, but not the one that the artist mm -hmm. talking yeah, about. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, this is for the bankers. Yes. Yeah. So the for the Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. So two. And also rate of return, marginal return on equity is different between banker doesn't have this one. Household has a this extra cost. So so this is more like a separation of the budget constraint uh, during the time of they are running the bank because of their uh, they cannot pay the negative dividend, or they cannot ask the uh, uncle to, <laughs> to contribute more. So, so yes. So yes, and the incentive constraint is also basically the leverage cannot be too high. If it's too high, they are going to divert the asset. So if you this divide by n, <laughs> you can see the Tobin skew have to be bigger than theta times the leverage multiple. So, so that's the acting like an endogenous leverage constraint uh, just coming from the steering. OK, and the rest of you is them is just uh, as, yeah? Yeah. 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 Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yes, yes. Yeah, stochastic version, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, there is both, yes. And the extra risk is evaluated not by marginal rate of substitution, but uh, this guy too. So, so that's the, uh, and the, uh, Yes, good point. As long as you have a dividend payout, like a sigma, there is an exogenous exit. <laughs> and also, household is not as good as the bankers. You can get the spread even in the deterministic steady state. Yes, that's, that's correct. Yeah? Uh, Multiple. Uh, ah. Yeah, uh, this one, you mean? Yeah. Yeah. We haven't tried yet. Multiple equilibria come from the run, actually. Uh -huh. so, so as a system-wise. Uh -huh. So, so <coughs> not, I don't think individual-wise. Uh -huh. So individually, basically, the, it's like a market determined stuff. So for example, these five equations, like uh, you can uh, basically solve this one and uh, this guy is like a market spread. Like a, this is a market spread. This is a market division. And partly, yes, uh, <laughs> but uh, I don't think so. But uh, I have to check. Yeah. So I cannot tell you completely there is no multiple equilibrium in the individual. I think it doesn't. But yeah. It's aggregate. aggregate, yes. Okay. Uh, yeah. Aggregate, yes. Aggregate wise, what happens is the amount the banker can finance depend upon their net worth and also endogenously determine this uh, leverage multiple from previous one. And then the rest of the capital is financed by the household. This is like a, a bank credit channel. So flat uh, bankers' financing capacity depend upon their net worth, aggregate net worth. Where the aggregate net worth comes, partly continuing guys, continuing uh, bankers, sigma fraction, uh, previous return on assets minus the deposit payment is their bar, uh, net worth. While the, this is a newcomer's, this is uh, Uncle Gib, <laughs> and uh, this is a new banker's net worth. And the uh, goods market is consumption, is the return on capital and the return on uh, labor, which it's constant, we assume. And then net of the tri uh, this management cost is the output. It's almost endowment economy, except uh, wedge is fluctuating. <laughs> uh, the, the basically, debt weight is fluctuating. Uh, so that's the model. Are you all right? Oh. Okay. So the, what is a bank run? Uh, yeah. You. 
Yeah. It's coming from incentive constraint. Or oh, this guy. <laughs> after after realizing you choose uh, how much to uh, the leveraging up. But the uh, morning what happened is the bank run. So so I will explain now. So so what is the bank run in our case? It's like uh, in the beginning of the period, the deposit uh, decides whether to roll over the deposit or not. And uh, if they don't roll over, the bank uh, have to dump the asset. And the uh, asset price is going to be different, which we d later derive it, but uh, this is the uh, fire sale price, and that is fire sale price. If the fire sale price, the bank's return from last period is not big enough to cover the promised return, the banker will default. So this is the, the multiple equilibria. So normal time, if nobody will uh, automatically renew, then Q is a normal Q, asset price. But uh, if the everybody runs, the, then the price drops enough then bank, every bank <laughs> yeah, will collapse, and uh, nobody wants to <laughs> roll over the deposit. It's a, it is a multiple equilibrium in this sense. Yeah? So there, there's uh, mm. a literature, the oh. global game. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. And uh, it turns out to be. Yeah, we try and <laughs> miserably <laughs> fail. The reason is the global game, if you have a forward-looking asset price, that's a nightmare, actually. So then, then the, I was kind of depressed. And then, then I bump into the Michi Kandori the, in Tokyo. And uh, he said, yeah, you can use the sunspot. <laughs> <laughs> so, so this is the, like uh, Michi Kandori uh, said, OK. The <laughs> the basically what we did, cheap and cheerful way, like a typical macroeconomist does, is the the if the bank run equilibrium exists. So like uh, the this is the threshold of the uh, the productivity shock low enough, and uh, also realized the uh, uh, next period the. Uh, the asset price as a function of stochastic this guy is low enough to cover the deposit obligations, not less than that, the bank run equilibrium exists. This is a fundamental part. And uh, if this is uh, zero, bank run is not there. But uh, if this is uh, plus, on top of that, there is a, a probability of appear in the sunspot. So if and only if bank run equilibrium exists and the sunspot appears, the bank run realizes. And then we assume the bank run, the sunspot is con constant. But uh, this way is endogenous. Yeah? yeah? Take, take to the capital stock. So basically deleveraging. Yeah. Yeah, so, so they just uh, do buy the equity directly. No, because of the debt weight cost is big, actually, I will solve for the asset price. The asset price and after the bank run is the ability household is the only one who hold the bank, uh, the capital stock. And, uh, we assume the new bank uh, only enter next period. So, so during the heat of the crisis, the new one can not come. But that's not essential. But the new one comes eventually. But the household will fall. So then what happened to the stock price is actually the household's, the, uh, the oil equation says the household have to pay the extra management cost. And therefore, if you compute through the iterating uh, the stock price, it's uh, the asset price. Stock price is the expected present value of dividend minus the uh, management cost. And the management cost is big 
uh, when they have uh, more uh, assets. So, so the, sorry, uh, the, this guy is quadratic. So <laughs> it gets bigger. No, no. It's like uh, the capital return is uh, this one. So then the, uh, the household either buy the equity or banker buy the equity. And uh, every deposit, every dividend is going to the, uh, the shareholders. Shareholder, I mean, is the banker or the household. So the Z is same, same exogenous stochastic process. The only difference between banker and the business, the banker and the household is the banker don't require any extra, extra input to get the returns, while the household need the extra return, extra uh, goods to ma manage and uh, screen as well as uh, monitor the companies. So company always pays Z. And the money goes to the debt weight. And the debt weight is bigger during the crisis. Nobody no, nobody benefits. The crisis, nobody benefits. And uh, at the margin, everybody is indifferent for the household. And the banker is all wiped out. It's very crude. Yeah. 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 Bank. And that's held directly by the firm. Firm. Yeah. Like yeah. The yeah. Yeah. Much less to, yeah. That's right. That that way. That, that way. Uh, and then eventually, banker starts coming. New banker starts coming, and then it starts recovering. So that's the how we consider. And the, because of that weight cost is bigger. Uh, the this guy is bigger, and the price is lower. This is the net pre the asset price is the net present value of dividend minus the marginal management cost. And uh, the today it's it's all the equity is held by the household. It's biggest, and tomorrow this is uh, slowly coming back to normal. But during that time, the extra management cost is bigger. Yeah. Uh, they they come from retirement. So so the people so F fraction is a banker. Every period some or existing banker retire. And then new banker, same number of new banker is coming in to replace. And uh, at the beginning you have an exogenous little equity injection. One question is why the equity injection doesn't react to the market conditions and uh, but to yeah so in a sense we can relate to what Daryl was doing uh -huh. here yeah. because in a sense what's going on is that right weight uh, right bidder for the stock for the new cap for yeah. the new yeah. capital for the bank yeah 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 and professional guys get out yeah and then you have to take time to, to so yeah to Sticky capital or something. Low value people. So low value people because they have to pay this after price. Yeah. 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 It is. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It is. Yeah. It's similar. Yes. Yes. So, so the when you look at the oops, sorry, the the this fire sale price, the after wiped out, slowly recovering. Ah, the. So that's the uh, fire sale price. And how do you calibrate this kind of things? The, some of the number is standard. Yeah. Hmm? Uh, hmm? Calibrating everything. Now. Uh, not quite, but uh, for example, <laughs> no. Yeah, estimators. Yeah, yeah. Do the estimation. Yeah, econometric. So, so this one is the like a, I would say numerical example, but some, some. But the, for example, like a, 
this number is a suspicious number. Like, uh, how much fraction of assets banker can steal? Like, uh, you cannot just use the one observation <laughs> like my. It's a lot of <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's right. Twenty-two percent is enormous, but the, the basically we try to hit the target of the like a uh, ten, ten, the average ten. Yeah, and uh, also like uh, dividend payout ratio, we set the six point five percent quarterly. Like uh, so, oh, of the net worth, it's enormous. Yeah, so net worth, so so. It's including bonus or something like uh, as long as it's not hugely low, like uh, then we we are happy. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. And then spread is about uh, forty-five basis point. And uh, so so first three num these things uh, we uh, and also the what is the probability of sunspot? We use the basically the uh, run probability of is like a 1.1 percent per quarter, which is like a every four e year is like a four percent. So it's like a every 25 years, we have a banking crisis. This is a not the individual bank run; it's systemic <laughs> entire meltdown. So, so that's the number we use. Yeah. 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 Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so the you have a fundamental shock, which is the productivity shock, which come from output fluctuation things we calibrated. But the I will tell you what's weakness and strength uh, ah, here. So, so the it's so what we got. So the right now only shock we have is a productivity shock. And the uh, sunspot, and uh, so suppose we have a big productivity shock, like uh, 1.4 times as much as the steady state value, so standard deviation, sta standard deviation, which is uh, pretty sizable. Then actually the round probability will sh shoot up, and uh, so, but the uh, one possibility is no sunspot appears. So then output loss and the net worth loss is tiny. So, so as long as sunspot doesn't appear, output loss is just the productivity shock coming. And uh, bankers' intermediation a little bit go down, but it's not too big. Uh, this is actually similar to credit cycle paper. Actually, we call it the banks, but you can rename the everything. These guys are farmers, and this is the gatherers, and the less efficient guys. And uh, we just changed the name, actually. So how can you change the name to publish another paper? But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but uh, it has some little different mot motivations. And, uh, so, so this is the efficient guys. This is less efficient guys. Uh, so, the, so what happened is the, if you look at the productivity shock, you get the net worth effect. So banker, continuing banker has a ne less net worth. And then when they have a less net worth, their ability to lend is going down. And as a result, it goes to the household, who is less efficient. Then asset price drops. So asset price drops, uh, the, the net worth drops. And especially you have a big uh, net worth, debt uh, to repay, which is bigger than the uh, dividend from uh, capital stock or newcomer's equity, then you have a, a leverage, so debt overhang. So net worth is dropping faster than Q if Q drops. As a result, despite of Q drops, net worth is dropping faster, and the uh, banker's ability to finance go down. So this is the exactly the same as the credit cycle. So the, the reason you don't get too much kick is the pro against the productivity shock, net worth effect is relatively minor. So it's a flow of shocks. If you hit the capital quality or capital destroy the capital stock, you get the big one. Uh, but uh, 
if you hit this z quarterly, it's not too big, actually. So that's why the extra kick was not too big. And the output drops, and the net worth drop is sizable. It's like a, not like 1.4%. 1, 1 it's actually dropping like a 10%. And the uh, bank intermediation does drop like a 5%. But the output loss was not extra output loss is that big because of, first of all, debt weight <laughs> is not that big. And the extra debt weight is not that big. But the different story is a bank run. So when you have a negative shock, likelihood of staying in the so probability of entering into the bank run region go up. <laughs> and as a re and uh, when you hit the sun, then the economy collapses. Basically, the bank is completely wiped out, takes a long time to recover. And then the bank intermediation completely disappears and then slowly recover. Excess return shoots up and asset price collapses and the output does collapse. If the, this is a quadratic uh, the management cost, which is normally it's not that big deal, but if it really collapses, it does collapse. So output loss can be as big as 7%. So this is the, like, uh, the, 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 the bank run. Due to the, the triggered by the uh, sizable productivity shock. But the, yeah. So presumably the, the, the governments yeah. could. Ah, if they can, yeah. The same big, big diamond solution yeah. and uh, sure. No, 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 no. no. The, if, the, if people take their money out, the government can yeah, yeah, yeah. promise that no. if they keep it in, they'll get the full amount. Uh, and if you do the. In, and then the governments. So if you do the, if you do the deposit insurance, yeah. then it's a kind of disaster because of nothing to stop the stealing. So, so the banker will leverage up like crazy, and then the everybody steal the money, and the government have to bail out. So, so the deposit insurance without the regulation, uh, leverage regulation, so is- So what would, the, what would the regulation be? You have to be, you have to leverage, uh, the, this leverage, uh, so leverage have to be capped. So if you don't leverage cap and just do the uh, deposit insurance, mm -hmm. it's a free stealing society. Like a, somebody told me like a Bulgaria introduced the deposit insurance and then, then bankers start stealing like crazy and uh, to the private project. <laughs> and uh, it was a complete nightmare so because of they didn't have a proper regulations. Uh, so, so if you don't have a, the then then it then works. Then yeah. Then you don't have yeah. 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 That's true. So so government have to have a big stick to so, uh, stop the diverting things. Yeah. 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 Uh huh. Ah. Uh ah. -huh. It's binding. But the, the, this one, we assume the household knows what they are doing. And uh, therefore, household is going to make sure banker will not leverage too much you know, relative to the Tobin skew, so that the, they don't divert the assets. Yeah. So these are re observable for the household. The problem of this model right now is the, you need the, some reasonably big productivity shock. But uh, before the crisis, we don't see any productivity shock. Actually, if anything, it's actually improving. <laughs> so, so we don't see anything. So, so how come you get the, like a bank run? So that's the next question. So, and also, we said that usually bank run happens after the credit booms. So, so how do you get that? So this is uh, now you are going to divert a little bit dangerous uh, field, which is a heterogeneous belief. Is it allowed to do that kind of thing? <laughs> so, so this is the heterogeneous belief. You are going to talk about it, OK? I, I'm glad to introduce these things. So basically, we are going to have a bank's belief. 
So bank uh, sync. So there is a news, and this is the usual uh, like uh, AR1 process, but uh, this is the innovations. And the bankers uh, occasionally get the news, which suddenly they said, next uh, big T period, we are going to have a big positive productivity shock, innovations. And uh, with probability, uh, this guy. So, and the probability that big innovation comes is uh, distributed according to that guy. Maybe picture is easier. So this is conditional on bank run, bank, the big innovations, big breakthrough. So what to be the uh, likelihood timing? So they t equal zero, <laughs> t equal one, they get the news. And next big t period, about 20 period, you have a likelihood of getting the big breakthrough around this timing. And the banker is absolutely convinced, almost. It's not 100%, uh, but they are very close to optimistic. And uh, this is going to happen. So, so then what is going to happen is that nothing happens. And, and uh, this is uh, news which only banker uh, find it. But uh, not the household don't believe this kind of thing. So these guys are crazy, and uh, they are actually don't believe the bankers. But uh, as long as banker believe, the franchise value, continuing uh, continuation value for banker is rather good. So household knows the banker will not steal the money because of their killing the. Uh, they ca they are going to make a make a lot of money. Uh, this yeah. No, no. It's all come together to the group, the all bankers. And the household don't believe it. It's a heterogeneous uh, belief in this. And what is the source of this news? Uh, it's just uh, exogenous news. Like okay, a but no, but what is it? What, what do you think of it? Ah, OK. So, so like, yeah. like a new breakthrough, like a, say FinTech. So FinTech will change the world, uh, and the banker believe it, but the household say, wait a minute, it might not be that way. And uh, so, so, so the, do you have a question? No, is it okay? So, so the, this is the, uh, what happened to the belief. So initially, banker is almost certain this is going to happen. But uh, as long as nothing happens, the, they become, less and less convinced. <laughs> it's become more and more uh, pessimistic. And uh, at some point, after like, the period is over, they, they said, oh god, nothing happens. <laughs> That's it. And, uh, but the interesting thing is, as long as nothing happens, likelihood the next time is going to happen is actually going up. So, so the last moment actually Conditional on which happens, it has to be tomorrow, because uh, tomorrow is the last day. And uh, so actually, the pro their expected uh, success rate, or the big breakthrough, is actually not going down so quickly. This is something which is I experienced working with John Boa. And uh, John sometimes said, I have a great idea. And, uh, okay. I'm slightly suspicious, but uh, let's try. <laughs> and so, so we start trying the different method. OK, this, how about this? How about that? How about this? And they keep failing. Actually, we, we are getting less convinced <laughs> this is a good idea. But the truth is that as long as you don't make the same mistake, conditional probability of success next round is increasing, actually, because of the the only one left, that must be the, the only last chance. So actually, the often successful researcher is very persistent, actually. Even if the despite of keep failing, you, you keep trying until you run out of everything. So yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so you don't make, a, you make the same mistake, it doesn't work. But as long as you remember the previous mistake and uh, you keep trying the new things and then uh, you exhaust all the possible cases, you give up. It's actually the good, not the bad strategy for research, actually. You, 
you learn something, and uh, this doesn't work, basically. And, but uh, initially, you keep pushing, 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 pushing. And then, so this guy, the con unconditional probability of success go down, but the conditional um, next one, succeed, is actually going up. So, so that way, actually, you can get the big boom in the intermediation because of Tobin's Q is get bigger. And uh, because of Banker is more efficient, like uh, output is going up too. And uh, so, but the danger is the probability of entering into the crisis zone is getting high. Normal time is 10%, and the sunspot is 10%, it's the likelihood is 1% of bank run. Now, even multiply 0.1, it's like a 0 0.6, 0 0.06, like a 6% chance. Have a, because of you are now leveraging up. And then if nothing happens, <laughs> yeah, yeah, you are basically over leveraged. So, so the, this is the something we are going to have a credit booms, bank intermediation boom before the crisis. So, so then what happens? So expected probability of productivity is going up uh, after until after a little bit of peak, actually. And then, then the, here the, the bank run region enter, even without any additional shocks. You just need the, like a banker was wrong. <laughs> so then, then the, without extra any productivity <laughs> shock, you enter into the danger zone. And uh, as a result, when happened is the two scenario. One is no sunspot realizes, and then economy just go back to normal without chaos. Output is going back to the normal. But uh, if sunspot appears in the this region, which <laughs> no additional shock, but the uh, banker was optimism turns out to be wrong, then economy will collapse, and uh, and then the bank intermediation wiped out and uh, excess return shoots up and asset price drops and the uh, output drops. So